Hi, uh, and welcome to Test Driven Development in Open Source Projects. Uh, my name is Jonathan Burkhan. Uh, I'm an open source contributor for IBM. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means I work full time on open source software projects on behalf of IBM. Day in, day out, uh, I ship code to various open source projects. Uh, currently, I'm a contributor to Kubernetes, uh, specifically Kubernetes operators. Uh, previously, I've worked on Service Catalog, another Kubernetes extension project. Uh, before I worked on Kubernetes, I worked on another open source platform called Cloud Foundry. So I've been in this space for around five, six years now. Um, so hopefully I have something you might call wisdom uh, that I am here to share with you about why, why tests are good, why you should write tests for your open source projects, and how they can help you manage the sort of distributed world of open source software development. Uh, before we go any further though, I do have uh, sort of a, a caveat. Uh, this talk was originally going to be a interactive sort of live coding tutorial. Um, given the pandemic and the shift to online, uh, it was decided to rewrite this as sort of a more conventional presentation of me talking uh, at you. Um, however, if you would like to follow along, especially if you're viewing this as a recording, uh, all of the code that I'm going to be tinkering with is available online at my GitHub. Uh, so just follow that link on the screen and check out the code yourself and try and follow along. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so test-driven development. Uh, that term, in my experience, has been sort of contentious. When you when people hear you say that, they're like, oh, I really like that. Oh, I really hate that. Um, but it's it's kind of lost its meaning from overuse. So I want to I stop, take a moment to, to sort of define what exactly I mean when I say test-driven development. To me, test-driven development is using tests to drive out functionality of your software. Uh, in that respect, the tests themselves are really sort of the primary uh, store of functionality of your software. Uh, if you have some feature, the test you wrote that proves that that feature exists and then that feature works the way that you think it does is really, really sort of the, the primary form of that feature. The source code that implements that feature is, you know, the, it actually causes it to exist, but it's the test that proves that that source code does what you think it does. That means the tests come before implementation. You need to create a test that describes the functionality you're trying to create, uh, that proves it exists. And that also means that tests, test writing is hand in hand with development. Uh, it's not something that you sort of have a separate QA section for. It's not something that happens after the fact. Uh, writing tests is development itself. It's done by the developers. It's done before you actually even write the source code. It happens at the same time by the same people. So why would we want to do this? In a sort of normal, non-distributed software development team, it might look something like this. You have a single unit of people who collaborate with each other to create a product, to work on a project. And hopefully, uh, the sort of knowledge of the state of the project is distributed amongst them and shared because they're all working together. Um, and I realize this is an idealistic sort of view. Uh, even single teams are often geographically and temporally distributed. Uh, but in an ideal world, it might look something like this. Uh, in my experience, most open source project teams tend to look something a little bit more like this. Uh, they're geographically distributed. They have members that work for different companies in different time zones. Uh, different people with different expertise are responsible for different parts. Uh, so often uh, the responsibility for developing the software is distributed along with that expertise, which means in terms of who wrote what part, the actual software product ends up looking something more like this. You have a whole bunch of different pieces that connect with each other that were written by different people at different times, some of whom, you know, maybe not even, don't even work on the project anymore. So to loop this back around, if you use test-driven development as a methodology to develop your project, you will know even though many different hands touch many different pieces of the software, when a new change comes in and 
it has the test for the new feature, as well as all the old tests that were written for previous features, and all those tests pass, you know that your software continues to work uh, because the tests pass. And the tests prove that your software worked at the beginning, so uh, you know that it still works now. So to sort of demonstrate uh, what I mean by this methodology, uh, most of this presentation is going to be sort of a live coding exercise. So hopefully this works. Uh, okay, so what I have here is a very basic sort of program uh, that acts as sort of a calendar uh, you can set dates and check if the date is a holiday, yes or no. And although I have a very basic sort of scaffolding set up right here, so far it doesn't actually do anything. I've written a very basic failing test, and I'm going to step through sort of the thought process of using TDD to drive out functionality of this program. Uh, Originally, like I said, this was intended to be sort of an interactive session. Uh, feel free to chime in with suggestions or questions. Uh, I have a, a moderator, Chris, standing by to forward those questions to me. Uh, so feel free to, to make in, uh, chip in and make comments. So uh, like I said, this is a basic calendar sort of uh, program. You set holidays and then you give it a date and say, is this day a holiday, yes or no? Uh, so I've started off with uh, set weekday holiday. So I should be able to set days of the week as holidays. We'll start off with Saturday. Uh, I don't come into work on Saturday, so Saturday's a holiday. Uh, and I've written a basic failing test that just instantiates a calendar, uh, sets a date. Uh, that's uh, the 6th of June 2020, uh, which I've selected because June 2020 started on a Monday. So one through five are normal days, six and seven should be holidays. Uh, I set Saturday to a holiday, which is a basic sort of uh, scaffold method I've created. doesn't actually do anything yet. Uh, and then I assert that uh, is holiday D, where D is June 6th, should be true. If it's not true, error and say Saturday should be a holiday. So if this test on the right, uh, I've written it to drive out the functionality of my program, what functionality does this test proves exist? Uh, currently, it fails. Uh, so what is the simplest possible change I can make to my program that makes this test pass? Now, you might think, oh, I could actually make set weekday holiday do something and, and, and store that state somewhere and actually drive up this functionality. But I haven't actually written a test that proves that that functionality should exist yet. So the simplest possible implementation I can write that makes this test pass is actually something that is trivial. I can just make it return true. And that'll make the test pass. Now, obviously, that's not a, a reasonable actual solution. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't actually written any test that means that that shouldn't be the actual solution. So how can I help write another test that drives out how this should actually function? Uh, so let's go ahead and add another test that's similar to this one, uh, but let's do the opposite case. So instead of test weekday holiday, let's say test weekday not holiday. And instead of a Saturday, we'll make the date 1, which is a, a Monday. And we can actually get rid of that. It's not actually doing anything for this test. So this shouldn't be true because Monday should not be a holiday. So now we have two test cases. I've written another test case, which should fail, hopefully, if I've done everything. OK, so we have a problem. Uh, currently, we're just always returning true, which works for the first test case, but doesn't work for the second test case. So again, what is the simplest possible implementation I can write that satisfies these two test cases? Uh, well, I can't just return true or always return false, because now we have sort of two different test cases. So I guess the simplest possible case is I can check uh, if the date is a Saturday. And if it is return true, else return false. Yeah, I forgot my 
my parentheses. Okay, so we've written a test, satisfies both those conditions. Uh, so the test passed, so that means we're good. Now, again, obviously, this isn't actually a useful implementation. All I've done is hard-coded in Saturday. Uh, but how do I prove that in the test case? Well, we can add another test case. So let's try Sunday, which would be June 7th. test case. Okay, so that fails. It passes on the first case, but fails on the second because we haven't actually made anything uh, that cares about whether it's Sunday or not. Now, we could go in and uh, you know, drive this out a little bit more, uh, hard code in equals equals Saturday equals equals Sunday. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and skip head uh, forward a little bit because I've already I've already sort of created the scaffolding and these methods aren't actually doing anything. So we're just going to go ahead and move those over here and store that state somewhere. Uh, so have a list of weekday holidays which is really just an array of strings. And And then rather than hard coding that in there, we're just going to range over that struct. Okay, so here a very basic actual implementation that should make our test pass. So that's great. We've sort of driven out this functionality. Um, but let's say that's that was, uh, you know, version one of our program. And now we want to write version two, we want to add a new feature, uh, say the ability to set a specific date as a holiday, like the 4th of July 2020. Um, before we even begin uh, in the source code, let's write a test case that drives out that functionality. So it's sort of similar to this test, and we're going to test uh, one specific day as a holiday, but instead of just days of the week, we're going to say test specific holiday. And we're going to do July 4th. And we know we want to be able to set this because it's a different kind of holiday. Now, this isn't going to compile because that method doesn't exist. So let's just go ahead and, and sort of fill in a very basic placeholder. Doesn't actually do anything, but it's enough to make the code compile. So go ahead and rerun the tests. And that fails. OK, so we've already got an implementation sort of working that worked for the previous one. So let's just go ahead and copy that, uh, add some more stuff to our struct, uh, specific holidays, date. 
Oops, if I use all the right parentheses. And then down here, uh, just make it range over that array. Uh, so hopefully that should pass. So we drove out that feature using a new test and you could, you could continue to iterate on this sort of process for a while. Um, writing tests to drive out new novel functionality, so on and so forth. Um, so let's go ahead and do that, but sort of take a twist on it this time. Uh, instead of adding, well, let me just go ahead and write the test case. So instead of a specific holiday, let's say we want to set a recurring holiday. Every uh, New Year's Day should be a holiday. Um, so a recurring holiday test would look something like this. So New Year's Day, both 2020 and 2021 should be holidays. Uh, and obviously that method doesn't exist yet, so we should go ahead and write sort of a placeholder. That doesn't do anything. But it's enough to make the code compile. And we have a failing test. Now, at this point, uh, we could just keep on doing what we've been doing, uh, add another struct to keep track, or add another field to the struct to keep track of this information, add another uh, range in our isHoliday method to check this. Uh, but let's say, uh, you know, we're adding feature three to our program, and I'm, I'm a, a different developer who, other than the one who wrote the, the first two features. And I say, uh, we could do that, but that's that's getting a bit cumbersome. We're adding all these four loops, and, and I really don't want to deal with that. I really don't want to deal with all the, the previous implementation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my refactoring hat, and I'm gonna go in and refactor some of this code. Uh, this seems like an ideal candidate for an interface. So before I even touch the novel functionality, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna refactor some of the code that's already been written. Let's say rather than storing every type individually, I'm just gonna have one single field called holidays. That is an array of holidays, which is an interface I'll create. And this interface specifies a single method, we'll call it equals. It takes in a date and returns a bool. Does this date equal a holiday according to whatever, whatever my idea of what a holiday is? And we'll implement this struct uh, for each of the, the, the three types we've got going on right here. So the first one, we'll say weekday holiday. That has a string. And then here, uh, and instead of keeping it specific, we'll just say append this to holidays.
And that's going to complain because that type I doesn't actually implement equals yet. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and I'm not writing tests. I would like to mention this for this functionality uh, because this is just an internal refactor. These methods aren't, I mean, uh, they aren't supposed to be publicly exposed. So it's not that anyone outside of this package would ever use it. I'm exposing the same interface that people have been using previously to interact with this package. So as far as they know, nothing has changed. So let's go ahead and write equals. which is really just this functionality right here. We say if weak, actually just and instead of ranging over that, I can just say Okay, so I've re-implemented weekday holidays using my new interface. Uh, we've still got the old functionality for specific holidays. So if I go back here and run the tests, theoretically, all of them, except for the ones for recurring holidays, which I haven't bothered to implement yet, should pass, which is great. We know we're sort of back where we started, despite the fact that I rejiggered stuff around on the inside. So let's go ahead and do the same for uh, specific holidays, which shouldn't be too difficult as long as I can remember to spell things right. Uh, and this has just a date. Uh, we can use this to do the interface. doesn't implement equals yet, so let's go ahead and make it do that. And again, this is really just uh, the functionality that we had down here, moved into a method. a parentheses somewhere. Oh, yep. And we can go ahead and get rid of this code because it's now covered by this generic function. So we're back to where we started, but now the previous functionality, which I had implemented a completely different way, has been refactored to this new interface. But all of those tests that I wrote still pass they still run in the same way. They still call the same methods with the same uh, fields, arguments, but everything that's happening in the back end is now completely different. But I know that my functionality didn't change. I know it still works the way it originally worked because my tests still pass. So when I were to go submit this change as a pull request and someone who, you know, I, this is a totally new implementation on the back end, they've never seen it before, but they have proof that it works because my tests say that it does. So that said, let's go ahead and implement the new feature using this new interface that I uh, made. So this should be fairly simple. And now it's, it's entirely self-contained, so I don't have to actually muck around with is holiday anymore or other people's uh, things like messing around with adding new fields to the struct. In fact, I can go ahead and get rid of all those fields there except for the generic holiday uh, array. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this. Uh, recurring holiday. Which has a month and a day. 
Uh, it needs to have an equals method. And then I just append it to that struct like so. And now that I've refactored it in this interface, I had to create the new methods. I don't have to change this holiday. I don't have to change the original struct type. And our test should pass. So I wrote the new test to drive out the novel functionality. I didn't have to change the pre-existing tests, despite the fact that I completely re-implemented the back end. Uh, and all of the tests passed, so I know that all the functionality still works. So Despite the fact that those three different features could have been written by three different people at three different times who they didn't even actually know each other or know why or how those tests were implemented, the fact that they were implemented using TDD proves that the functionality, the thing I actually want, still exists. It still works the way I want it to. Now, this test or this example was obviously a very uh, simplistic uh, implementation. So let's go ahead and take a look at some real world examples. So like I said, I'm a, I'm a Kubernetes contributor, developer. Um, so that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes is an open source platform as a service that hosts containers called pods, uh, runs them for you so that you can you know, run infrastructure in a, in a containerized manner. Uh, so the test we're gonna look at is a very basic test. It's just, can I create a pod uh, and update it? now? Uh, this is a, a version 1.9 test. So this, this test is probably in its original form around four years old. Uh, but it's a very basic sort of piece of the functionality of Kubernetes. Uh, it still runs in our CI every time anybody submits a pull request. And we know that our pods still work the same way they always have because this test passes. Uh, right now we're in the middle of ripping out the entire containerization technology that Kubernetes uses to run these pods, but this test still passes. It will still continue to pass, and we know that's why we have faith uh, that uh, it still works. Uh, so we make a pod, we create a pod spec uh, that has some, some fields in it. Uh, we sync the pod spec, which will cause eventually a pod to be created in the background. Uh, we then use the label we put on it to find the pod. We expect that it comes back or rather we expect that it does an error. Uh, we expect a single pod to come back. Uh, we then update that field in it with a new, a new value. And when we come back, we expect that the pod's okay and has a new value. So you can kind of see how this is a, a similar sort of uh, uh, very basic test of I do a thing, I expect the value that comes back uh, to be what I set it to, which is similar to the test we were writing in our calendar uh, application. Uh, now this is obviously a bit more complicated because it's running containers and stuff in the background, but the, the sort of the core idea is the same. I interact with this, this thing using the interface that I define, and I expect a certain outcome to come back. Now, like I said, we're currently in the process of rejiggering the, the containerization technology with you. So what's actually happening in the back end can change how we run that pod, uh, where we run that pod, so on and so forth. But this itself, the idea that when I, I request a pod to be created, it comes back, that still works. I know it'll work because this test will continue to pass. Uh, and then we have a similar test that's also from 1.9. So this test is also you know, four years old at this point. Uh, this is sort of a similar test where we create a pod uh, and then we hook it up to a service, which is how uh, routing sort of interior in Kubernetes works. Um, so we connect, create a pod, connect it to a service, and then uh, I think this is we, yeah, we expect that the, the environment variables that that service should be exposing interior to the pod 
that we would use to receive this incoming connection are populated. So again, the implementation of how this happens in the back end, uh, since this test has been written, I know the entire routing infrastructure of Kubernetes has been rewritten. This is how this actually happens, uh, has entirely changed, but this test has not uh, because the observed functionality of the feature still works the same. Uh, so this test continues to be good. And these tests were written hand in hand with the people who originally implemented this functionality. Uh, so that when I submit a pull request that changes how this works, uh, you know, this is sort of proof that my change works, my new feature works, and I didn't break anything that uh, existed previously. Okay, so let me stop the screen share and go back here. So that's sort of uh, my rundown, sort of a, a very basic tutorial on how you can use TDD to drive functionality for open source projects. Um, so now I would like to take a moment to open the floor up to questions. Uh, I have a helpful moderator, Chris. I've been assured that I will be able to see or hear your question. So, yeah. Uh, so far, we just had uh, two questions. One about sharing the link of the presentation. I noted that the slide handout, there should be a widget at the bottom to download the slides, but I'm not sure if you have any extra materials beyond that, Jonathan. Uh... A widget, Avail you say? Uh, it is, maybe it's only available to attendees, but. Ooh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm not the most familiar with this technology. Um, so I, I can tell you, I will make an effort to make the slides available either on the schedule or failing that, I'll just upload them to the uh, GitHub website. Oh, that. If you don't have the yeah. slides, that doesn't work, does it? Um, we could do it afterwards. Um, one, of, one of the moderators just said that we could do it afterwards. If we okay, yeah. So, so I will I will make all available efforts to to make sure that these slides uh, make it out some way to you. So, thank you for that. Okay. So, um, some more of the meteor questions. So, how do you test functions working with databases? Uh, so that. Uh, that can be a more complicated question, yes. Um, the answer is, is you have multiple multiple kinds of tests that implement, uh, that test multiple kinds of features. So uh, going back to my holiday calendar example, let's say rather than just a simple struct uh, that exists in, uh, you know, in, in memory, uh, we're storing a very large number of holidays in a database on disk somewhere. Uh, the answer would be, and from a unit test perspective, uh, that's the test I was running was unit tests, then I, would, I wouldn't have a single unit of functionality anymore. I would have the, the sort of middleware that exists, that's where all this functionality exists, and then I would have sort of a back end of the database itself. Um, so I would, now that we're, we're you know, implementing a more complicated application, we need more complicated tests to uh, prove that that functionality exists. And I would do that in two ways. Uh, so the unit tests, the tests that we're writing here, those would continue to look pretty much the same as they do. Uh, the difference being is that rather than storing that state locally in a struct, I would have a database that contains uh, that data. And the interface between the two would be faked out. Um, so I would have the unit tests, which aren't actually necessarily the tests I wrote. They don't actually care how the data is stored. They're checking the, the like application logic of the is uh, you know July Fourth holiday, and those would continue to to operate the same. Uh, the actual data that's being tested against in the unit tests wouldn't actually go all the way to a real live database that has data in it, because that's not really what I'm trying to test by this unit test. I'm not trying to test the functionality of the database. I'm just trying to test that uh, when I set July Fourth as a holiday, the uh, sort of the logic I wrote in my calendar struct itself works. Uh, so I would fake out the interface between the code I wrote here, the sort of this uh, calendar package itself, and the database. Uh, now, I want to make sure that my application as a whole still works, though. So how would I do that? Uh, then I would have to go and write integration tests. So I wrote this unit test that proves that my calendar unit works the way I expect it to. That one piece works. Uh, but I need to make sure that the entire uh, integrated application as a whole, the unit 
running that has the calendar logic and then the underlying database function correctly together. Uh, so I would write an integration test that actually maybe builds an entire thing, uh, maybe does some fancy fake out stuff again, uh, and then assert from the front end that, okay, when I say set July 4th as a holiday, that percolates through and ends up in the database. And then when I check uh, that that you know, is July 4th a holiday, it comes back up uh, through the, the whole sort of integrated application. Uh, so it's, it's sort of multiple layers of testing. Um, Kubernetes, you know, an actual open source project, uh, the testing itself is, is a project unto itself. Uh, so Kubernetes, for instance, has multiple suites of tests, unit tests that test the individual uh, libraries or packages like the one I just showed you. Uh, integration tests that tests, okay, now I, I have these two pieces, how do they work together? And then end-to-end -end tests that actually stand up an entire system and then you know pushes buttons and makes sure that uh, the, the functionality of the system as a whole is what I expect it to be. Um, and again, each of these each of these test suites is just further further uh, you know further insurance that when we make a change, uh, we didn't break anything. If a test fails, we know generally what broke and we can go, you know, where it broke and where to go fix it. Um, so the more tests, the more kinds of tests, the more coverage you have, uh, it's just another tool to make sure that you didn't break anything. Um, how much, oh, sorry. Uh, Chris, do you just want to curate the questions for me? I'm not really sure. I got stuff coming in from multiple places. Yeah, sure. So the next question is, how much time normally do you think TDD adds to your overall development time? So that's sort of uh, not really a straightforward question. You are correct in that if I just simply wasn't writing tests, it would take me a lot less time uh, to just write the source code, ship it out. Um, I'd like to go back a bit, though, to these orgs charts I sort of made up. Um, the problem with that is that if a purple person writes just just writes some functionality and ships it out, uh, and then some you know indeterminate time later a green person needs to make a change to that thing, uh, they don't necessarily know how it works, what working is. If I make a change to it, how do I know the original functionality still works? So that sort of distributed responsibility and that sort of distributed functionality uh, really needs test cases to even work in the first place. Uh, otherwise, you know, a person down the line who didn't write develop the code eventually, how are they going to know it works? How do they know how it's supposed to work? Um, so I would argue that really in the long term, especially for open source projects, which are inherently distributed team wise, uh, that this really saves a lot of time in the long run. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and I, there, there was uh, a similar another, question that was kind of saying, like, do you think the project management would agree with how much time maybe you would spend on <laughs> some of these things? As a, from just starting to code first and then writing the test later. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely. Um, so I would also argue that although it looks, and I know this is this is a big hurdle to get over, although it looks very cumbersome and curmudgeonly, if you code in this style, eventually it becomes sort of second nature uh to to write the tests especially beforehand i think that's that's also very important if you if you write the source code first and then backfill the tests later you're you're sort of putting the cart before the horse you're you're pre-confirming your your pre-existing notions of how this thing is supposed to work and you can get blindsided on that later because you didn't you know, you didn't think to put this weird test case in because you didn't think because you already wrote the happy path and maybe this weird sad path, you know, is going to come back to blindside you later. But if you write the tests first and you use the test to drive out your functionality, you know it works because you wrote the test that describes the functionality and then and only then went and implemented that. You can sort of, you know, use the step-by-step -step process to, to formally describe what the software itself is doing. Um, yeah, I mean, in my experience, uh, like this has saved huge amounts of time in development costs, uh, 
just because when something breaks, we generally know why it broke and where it broke and, and what we can do to fix it. Um, rather than, you know, running fast and, and writing, you know, just writing a whole bunch of source code and then six months down the line, or even just the next time a different person has to pick up that piece of code and it breaks and we don't know why it broke or how it broke or who broke it. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, the next couple questions are related to code coverage testing. Like as besides from test-driven development, how much of your time would you focus on working on things that will increase the code coverage? And do you think that there's a good percentage of code coverage to shoot for for testing? So uh, in a perfect world, obviously, code coverage would be 100%. Um, I don't no, I don't know how useful in real development code coverage as a metric is because I know I could very easily write trivial tests that give me 100% code coverage and do nothing or test nothing. I could write, you know, tests that are very helpful and very useful that don't really increase that number. And this is definitely something I've, I've had real experience with in, in the real world. Um, so I actually don't put too much stock in code coverage, like just some number that on my project that says, oh, you know, you're 75% covered. Okay, but what, what are the tests actually doing? What functionality are they actually driving out of the product? I would focus a lot more on sort of the behavior of the tests rather than just some static number of, oh, you have this many lines covered. Well, that's great. So I don't, I don't actually put much stock in, in code coverage metrics. Do you think that there is a bad percentage or a bad percentage? That's, that's yeah, like, what if I'm, what if I'm shooting around like 35%, do, would you try to dedicate some time to improving that or is it? Is uh, I would, to... but I feel, I feel, I feel if you've gotten to that point that your number is something very low like that, um, that you really need to take a step back and reassess how you're doing development to begin with. Like I said, I, re I really don't like going back and writing, you know, writing the source code and then going back and backfilling the tests. I feel like that's going to, that's a very bad habit and it's going to come back to bite you because you can't, you know, you wrote that source code and you, you think you covered all the things in the tests, but you, you didn't really, you don't really know. How do you know unless you, you wrote the test first to drive out the functionality and only implemented features that you proved you needed the existence of? Uh, and that, that reminds me of a joke that's sort of, sort of semi-serious, but also sort of actually completely serious, is uh, any, any line of code that you can delete and not make a test fail should be deleted because it's very clearly not required. Otherwise, there'd be a test for it. Uh, so yeah, like I said, that's, that's only sort of half joking, but that, that's I think, a pretty succinct uh, sort of description of my philosophy. Sure. <laughs> Related to that philosophy, uh, we have a question. When you're writing the test after you already have the code, so I imagine this is something you'd probably see a lot in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have. Just for trying to uh, create the test afterwards. How do you avoid writing the code twice, as in just confirming what's already in the code? So uh, I would generally not like look at the code as little as possible when writing the tests. Um, especially if I'm writing a unit tests, I like to think of the, the, the package I'm testing as sort of a black box. Uh, and I wasn't really very astute in this on the, the coding exercise I, I did just now, but like making, you know, the things that are public are the, those are the buttons on this black box I can push. And it probably, you know, has another calls out to some other library. That's like the things that that black box goes and does. And the interior functioning of the black box, I'm not really supposed to know about or care about. Um, so really harp on what's publicly exposed and what's not. Try and only think about, okay, uh, set, you know, set uh, day of the week holiday. That's a publicly exposed method. What do I think that method should do? Don't actually even go look at the, imp the implementation. Just think about what, what should that method do? Okay, I'm going to go write a test that tests what I think that method should do. And maybe it'll blow up, maybe it'll not. Um, but if it does blow up, 
if it doesn't work the way I expected it, doesn't that really say something about the, the method itself? Maybe it's not even really an implementation change. Maybe it's sort of a, a management of expectations that needs to change. Maybe the method has a bad name. Uh, maybe it should be called something else. Yeah, so I would, I would avoid writing the code twice by literally not even paying attention to the code. Um, and that sort of goes back to my original philosophy of the tests are the sort of formal description of what the software should be doing. And you don't actually need to know the implementation of the software, hopefully, to know what it should be doing. You know that this package uh, should be doing a certain thing, and you presumably know what that is, uh, even if you don't look at the implementation itself. Awesome. Uh, Semi-related. What, what's your normal kind of plan of action when you get into a repository that has a bunch of feature code but might be lacking a lot of proper unit tests? Mm. So that's actually something I'm sort of in a situation with right now. Uh, I'm working on a, an operator SDK that was sort of written in that fashion. Some portions of it are well unit tested, but other large portions of it are not. Uh, and I mean, you, you, you got to make do with what you have. Um, I'm currently on a, a extensive rewrite project to implement unit tests for the parts that aren't tested. And like I said, uh, the, the process I just described is what I'm doing. I'm going in, okay, there's this package. It should do A, B, and C. I'm going to write a test that proves it does A, B, and C, and maybe that'll break stuff. Maybe it won't. Um, and you can use that process to sort of drive out refactoring, especially if, if a package was written without, you know, they just wrote the code and didn't bother to write tests. It often is impossible to actually write tests for that code simply to the way it's, it's, it's word. Maybe they have a whole bunch of private variables. Maybe they have a whole bunch of global variables. Oh. Um, so that actually can help drive out, uh, you know, a refactoring. The functionality of the code doesn't change, but it, it makes the pack, you know, you refactor the package so it's testable and that's going to make it uh, more reliable, uh, probably easier to understand instead of a whole bunch of spaghetti code. You've got, you know, neatly sort of refactored little packages that connect to each other instead of just being a whole bunch of mush. Um, so yeah, I think I think that can actually be a very helpful exercise, uh, backfilling tests and, and learning from that uh, to help sort of refactor the code itself. Awesome. So we have uh, just a couple questions left and Okay, we got minutes left in the presentation. Yeah. So, uh, next question: When you when do you write the functional tests, and when do you write your unit tests, or are you writing them at the same time? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by functional tests. Do you mean I'm assuming like end-to-end -end tests, like this whole thing functions at once? Um, so, I generally start off with the unit tests if I'm say adding a new uh, feature. And let's say, uh, you know, I have like, like a front end part and a back end part, and then a functional test would be writing, you know, making sure the whole thing works all the way through. Um, generally, like I said, I would start with unit tests, start working on either part A or part B, drive out that functionality using writing the tests first. And, you know, even, even if I, I write a whole bunch of good tests and use that to drive out the functionality of package A, uh, you know, the feature doesn't actually do anything yet, which is fine. Just because you aren't exposing novel functionality in the product as a whole doesn't mean, you know, you can't write tests that are helpful. And it's this sort of bottom up approach that I think is really what provides the faith that, you know, if you do the bottom up in part A, okay, I know part A works because I wrote all these unit tests. So I know part A works, even though that doesn't actually do anything in the whole scheme of things yet. I'm going to then go do part B, same thing, bottom up, make sure part B works the way I think part B is supposed to do. And then once I connect part A and part B, write functionality or end to end or integration tests that say, okay, now when I press this button on the front of part A, Part A is going to go do stuff and then press this button on part B and that's going to go do stuff and then return all the way back. And it works the way I expected it to. Awesome. Uh, this might be kind of answered by test-driven development, but at what point does a developer that is currently refactoring the original code, when should they modify the test suite associated with that? So this, this is existing code and test cases for it. They're doing it at the um, same time. 
Well, ideally never. I mean, so if you're, if you are truly only refactoring the code, the functionality of the code shouldn't change. So the test shouldn't have to change. If you, if you find yourself thinking and refactoring the code and you're like, Oh, I really need to change this test. Like that's the point where I would generally be like, something is wrong here. <laughs> Either the, maybe the test, I mean, it might be the test that the tests are actually written correctly, but that means you have a pre-existing problem that you need to, you know, think about and consider independently of whatever you were originally doing. Um, so yeah, that generally, that generally tells me someone somewhere, maybe me has screwed up if I think I need to change the tests while I'm just refactoring the code. Um, and I think we are just about out of time. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, I will make sure you can find the slides online. Uh, but yeah, thanks.